welcome back and welcome to our parallel session on participating in politics in low and middle income countries. Uh, we plan to go just around 1.30 uh, p.m. with this session, so thank you for your patience as we're starting a little bit late. Uh, we have four panelists. We're hoping our fourth will join us as we move on throughout our time here this afternoon. Um, as with other panels, we will go through a um, introduction from me um, and all of our panelists will speak for approximately nine minutes. Following that, I will ask them some questions and then invite the audience to ask questions as well uh, as we explore this topic. My name is Joseph Jones. I'm the executive director of the Harkin Institute for Public Policy and Citizen Engagement. I'm very excited to be here at Zero Project to talk about political participation for people with disabilities in low and middle income countries. At the Harkin Institute, we serve to uphold the legacy of retired Senator Tom Harkin, who's here with us um, at Zero Project this year. And at the Institute, we thought it was essential in developing um, and passing the Americans with Disabilities Act uh, to have, here we are, acting here, uh, Senator Harkin's push on that legislation. Hello. In supporting Senator Harkin's legacy, we engage in long-term research projects uh, for me personally, as a city council member for my hometown, um, I feel a great personal commitment to inclusion for all when it comes to participating in politics and in government. Political participation is of the utmost importance. It gives each citizen a voice of how they will be governed, and it's something that each citizen should be free to partake in. As you all know, Article 29 of the UNCRPD states just that. An engaged citizenship is a cornerstone for a healthy, functioning government. Specifically related to the rights of people with disabilities, political participation is essential to having full equality within your home country. The WHO reports that there are almost 1 billion people with disabilities worldwide. At 13% of the population, when people with disabilities are excluded from participating in politics and government, a large part of the people's voice is lost. Some of the most common barriers specifically for voting are existing stereotypes in the countries, lack of access, whether physically, linguistically, or informationally, legal and administrative barriers, institutional segregation, and limited support and or funding. When analyzing low voter turnout for people with disabilities, the factors for consideration are broken down into resources, recruitment, and psychological factors. The barriers I just mentioned oftentimes result in a lack of resources for those who wish to vote to be able to do so. Additionally, stereotypes and segregation can lead to a low recruitment of people with disabilities to vote. Various combinations of barriers can also present psychological barriers to people with disabilities who may wish to vote but feel uncomfortable pursuing it. For low and middle income countries, it's especially hard to tackle some of these barriers that result specifically in low voter turnout. However, there are many avenues that governments and organizations can pursue in order to improve political participation as a whole. For example, many African countries have signed treaties and conventions regarding the rights of people with disabilities, but this does not guarantee that those rights are upheld and that violations have consequences. Some of those countries have legislative stipulations either in their cons constitutions or in separate legislation affirming the rights of people with disabilities to elect and to be elected. Ghana has made great strides in incorporating technology into their elections, such as tactile ballot guides and sign language interpreters, as well as placing 117 people with disabilities as trained election observers back in 2004. Our friends from Sightsavers assisted in a project in Cameroon called Accessible Elections for People with Disabilities, which helped to refurbish voting booths with ramps, improve lighting and low level tables to increase accessibility. India is seeing a great increase in the number of people with disabilities, especially women with disabilities, joining local politics. 24-year-old uh, Katambiana Graham Panchayat became the first wheelchair-using woman to win an election in Odisha, and she is one of many people with disabilities who are changing the landscape of local Indian politics. The Georgian government recently passed legislation led by His Royal Highness Prince Mered, who's also here at the conference, to officially establish all of the rights guaranteed to citizens with disabilities, including specific language to guarantee access to voting and running as a candidate in any election activities. 
At home, for me, in the United States, out of 535 elected members of Congress, only 14 currently serving members have documented disabilities. That's about 3% of the members of Congress, while 12.6% of the United States population as a whole has documented disabilities. Mail-in voting has proven to be some, of the, some help in countries like the United States, but even then, having to disclose excuses or reasons on the mail-in form sometimes deters potential voters. And for low- and middle-income countries, there may not be resources or the infrastructure available to provide a mail-in voting option. But we've gone a long way, and there's hope in lots of places, led by many of the countries and organizations who are here today. We've seen increased voter accessibility in Paraguay, strategic lobbying and engagement in India, help for blind voters in Georgia and Turkey. And we're joined today by panelists from organizations that are making great strides. So our panelists here represent uh, the Federation of Disability Organizations in Malawi that's been working to expand the participation of people with disabilities in local government since 2012 with generous support from CBM International among several other initiatives focused on increasing inclusion for people with disabilities in Malawi. Disabled Empowerment and Communication Center is currently partnering with several organizations including World Education, Nepal Association for the Welfare of the Blind, and the National Federation of the Deaf in Nepal in order to help implement Reading for All, a project led by Humanity and Inclusion. And Sight Savers led many initiatives last year to fight against <laughs> treatable trachoma to prevent blindness, including beginning treatment in Yemen. Uh, Ghana is officially recognized as the first country in sub-Saharan Africa to eliminate trachoma. Uh, and the group also wrapped up a Million Miracles campaign, is that right? Uh, which raised money to provide one million cataract surgeries, among many things. So I'm looking forward to hearing from each of our panelists about the initiatives in their countries and um, look forward to our discussion as well. So I will turn it over to our friends from Nepal, starting with Devidetta. Devidetta will begin um, to talk to us about their program in Nepal. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I am Devidetta Achade, Executive Director of Disable Empowerment and Communication Center, Nepal. Uh, uh, in short from DC Nepal, Banke. DC Nepal is a disabled people organization. Uh, DC, uh, DC Nepal, Disabled uh, Empowerment and Communication Center, Nepal, established in 2007 with objective of empowering persons with disabilities. Disabled Empowerment and Communication Center has undertaken disability, disabilities as a cross-cutting issues of developing development, thus adopts multi-method approach to, in, to engage people with disabilities in decision-making level by political participation as well as civil society movement. The practice, uh, the practice namely, foresting accountability through inclusive planning process, ensuring representation of persons with disability in political participation, more than 600 persons are involved in different level of planning process. From Bajanath Banke from 2012, the project made the elected local bodies accountable for addressing the rights of persons with disabilities and respecting their political participation and independent living. The essence of the project is transforming political context of the country, addressing constitutional and political rights of persons with disabilities. The regular dialogue with civil society, movement, political parties, media person, and local bodies have been geared up. Mobilization of paralegals, more than 200 paralegals are mobilized in the project working area, has facilitated adopting bottom-up approach, ensuring, ensuring real change in the community. Thank you. You want to pass it on to Brenda? You ready? Yeah. Okay. My good one. You're on. It's right in front of you. Uh, they can hear you. Hello. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I would like to go further. Uh, what is uh, the project achieving, and what is uh, uh, the main 
a visible action that DHCN has ensured to make representation of persons with disabilities. As a state is in the transforming context, we have the political transformation by the election of the Constitutional Assembly. In this Constitutional Assembly, in fact, people with disabilities have pushed much more endeavor for the, re the representation modality. We have the mixed electoral process. And within the mixed electoral process, the first past, first all election, it doesn't represent persons with disabilities. That's why there is the representatives from the proportional representation mechanism. And within this, within this mechanism, people with disability are being elected by the, by, by the constitution. That is very important aspects, how the vulnerable group of people are being represented from the political level. And we also have uh, the electoral system accessible for all, and that means uh, people with disabilities are both uh, participating in the electoral process as well as they are representing politically from the different political parties to make sure that uh, they are uh, the part of the democratic process. So, so Dick has done a lot for mobilizing its paralegals, as uh, Mr. David Dutta mentioned. So how the impact we can observe in this process? That means the provincial and the local and the federal election we carried out, and in this election, adequate representation of people with disabilities have been ensured. And the inclusion of people with disability has been um, ensured in the local level decision-making bodies and the independent living of people with disabilities that has been guaranteed by the Article 19 of the, the CRPD, and uh, the engagement of people with disability in the local bodies. That is a very, very important aspect of the project. That's why we, we made these uh, initiatives like uh, the fostering accountability to ensure the rights of people with disability for political participation. The Success is that we have seven persons representative in the provincial parliament. We have five persons, five persons representing in the provincial parliament, as well as we have one person in the national assembly. 200 people, 200 persons with disability are representing in different decision-making bodies. And the consumers group and the government local bodies, 62 people are representing there. And 10, 55 pe persons have accommodated within the voting list. So these are the very good initiatives, the tangible result we have mentioned. Here, uh, a person who is representing in the National Assembly, he, then that result is based on the advocacy and the campaign made by DCN and the National Umbrella Organization, as well as the joint effort of the DPOs in Nepal. So how this has been financed? This political, the concept of political participation was initially supported by Abilis Foundation, by the, the Constitutional Assembly, where we pushed for the repre representation of people with disabilities, uh, people with disabilities in the Constitutional Assembly, and later on the Foundation for Open Society initiatives that supported for ensuring the accountability of the local bodies for the political participation in the local label, and then uh, International Foundation for the Electoral System also supported our organization to ensure that the people with disability are accommodated within the voting list, as well as they are being participated actively in the electoral process. Not only the electoral process, but monitoring the electoral process if this is accessible for all. This is the uh, essence of the project and the result. Uh, we don't have an adequate grant. It is just 25,000 per uh, dollar for, per year. This is very, very symbolic amount, but we ensure a lot of achievement, what we ensure through the Constitution and the legal provisions to make the election process 
accessible for people with disability. The electoral process, the National Election Commission has adapted the inclusive electoral process. That is a very, very important aspect in Nepal. The next step, step we would like to go for the DEC, uh, uh, I, I mean, uh, further strategy. Uh, I would like to go for this initiative with uh, uh, Mr. Devi Datta, and then I'll conclude this uh, presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Senior Advisor of DC Nepal, Mr. Uh, Dr. Bhidinadat Pokhrel. The strategy of DC enhances the coordination, coordination with local DPOs, disability organization for, for the upscaling of the project. The uh, imp implementation of recently published ordinance for utilization of local issues and management has to be executed and the metropolitan sites should be published for adopting similar project within government mechanism. And finally, uh, this is indeed a great uh, a privilege and honor for uh, our organization to be a part of uh, this uh, general project conference and being awarded this evening. That would indeed enhance our capabilities and our encouragement to transfer our knowledge and idea to share within the developing country in the global south. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you both for that uh, very enlightening presentation. I look forward to having more discussion with you when we're done. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Action Amos for his presentation. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. <coughs> uh, my name is uh, Achen Amos, and I'm the executive director for the Federation of Disability Organizations in uh, Malawi, uh, which is an umbrella organization for 12 uh, disabled persons uh, organization. Uh, my presentation is going to cover a bit of background of our organization, um, the work uh, we do, also the approaches that we have used uh, since uh, 2012, uh, post uh, the 2009 elections that we, we had. Then I'll also uh, talk about how uh, we identified uh, the approaches that we're using and also the impact and successes that we uh, currently have. And I'll talk also about uh, the current status quo and uh, the way forward. I should maybe start uh, by uh, talking about the organization itself. Uh, which is an umbrella organization of uh, 12 uh, disabled persons organization. We are operating in about 22 districts of the 28 districts of uh, Malawi. Uh, in Malawi, we have uh, an uh, estimated number of persons with disabilities uh, to be 1.2 uh, million uh, based on the CINTEF study uh, that uh, we did. Uh, currently, we're still waiting for uh, our national census uh, results, which will be out in April, so that uh, we compare the uh, data that we found and uh, compare it to the data that uh, the uh, National Statistics Office uh, found. Uh, I should uh, also mention a bit of uh, uh, legal background about uh, uh, the environment in which we operate in. There is no affirmative action for inclusion of persons with disabilities um, in the whole electoral process, even uh, to stand as uh, candidates, uh, both in uh, the tripartite elections, that is at uh, executive level, members of parliament, or uh, councillors. There is no affirmative action, there is no quota system. Uh, persons with disabilities have to compete equally with others. Uh, we have had uh, reforms that took place uh, where we were fighting to have at least a quota uh, 
in place, but this uh, did not work or did not see light because all other reforms, including if reforms to do with 50-50 uh, uh, campaign, were thrown out uh, by the current uh, government because they overpowered uh, others in parliament. So we have no such arrangement. So persons with disabilities have to compete with others at an uh, equal level, but then, as you know, the playground is not uh, the same. So uh, the pillars of our work is based on uh, mainly uh, to influence change. We mainly an organization that focuses on advocacy and lobbying. Uh, we do civic engagement and advocacy. We do research, capacity building for change, as well as uh, sustainability. So how have we been uh, working to ensure that we influence uh, change as well as uh, ensure that uh, there is inclusion of persons with disabilities in the electoral process. Firstly, after the 2009, we carried out some consultations uh, at uh, grassroots uh, level. Uh, we have, uh, uh, we have uh, villages, then we have uh, traditional authorities, then uh, we have uh, district level. So we started at the village level to consult persons with disabilities, what went well, what went wrong during the elections, and also to look at the issue to do with self-representation. Then we did, uh, after a year, we did an assessment. Then we started now putting up uh, some uh, strategic uh, direction on the work uh, that we wanted to do. And um, we also had to map uh, stakeholders that were key in our work, uh, especially to do with uh, self-representation, who were the key actors that we wanted. So we sat down with uh, all our affiliates, uh, the DPOs, and identified um, the key uh, stakeholders that we were uh, going to work with. And uh, we prioritized this uh, based on two areas. One, um, the level of uh, engagement or intent, as well as the level of uh, influence. So we mainly focused on those that had uh, influence and uh, with a high level of influence, as well as those that with a high level of uh, interest. And among them is the Malawi Electoral Commission, which we found to be key. What we observed was that uh, they needed uh, to support us, but uh, the challenge was uh, mainly to do with uh, ignorance. And as you know, when they say, uh, there's a saying in my country uh, which says, uh, if you want to own a cow, you must start to own a hen. So we said, we're not going to uh, bite it big, we'll start uh, slow. So based on the 2009 uh, outcome, uh, we only had um, one person with disability who made it into parliament. Uh, we had one, uh, two people that made it at uh, uh, council uh, level, and uh, the person who made it to parliament actually became uh, the deputy speaker of parliament. Uh, the person, one of the people who made it at uh, council level, uh, we assisted with the lobbying, and became a mayor in the uh, city. So we said with that, we were actually satisf sat uh, satisfied because that gave us a model on what we needed uh, to do. And uh, as I'm speaking currently in 2019, uh, out of uh, those three, currently we have about 42 that are, are standing and uh, we have 19 contesting for MPs position and uh, the rest are standing at uh, councillor uh, position. And we'll talk about uh, some of the uh, successes that we have had. So the successes that we had, uh, uh, after the, before the 20, uh, after and uh, before the 2009, we managed uh, to threaten the Malawi Electoral Commission with an injunction so that in 2014 the elections were to be stopped because they were not inclusive. There were no guidance uh, in terms of how uh, the elections were going to go. So we went ahead and started. Uh, the litigation process, but before we finished, some of the things that we wanted to be addressed were addressed. We also managed to get the Braille uh, cover sheets produced, accessible ballot boxes. Uh, we also managed to, out of the 22 districts we are working in, we worked in about uh, six districts, and uh, six people 
also managed to stand, as I have mentioned, three did not make it, but only the other three made it. We were part also of the monitoring uh, mechanism that was there. And the success is that uh, we had 50% uh, um, 50 uh, success in those that came. And we also worked with uh, uh, Malawi Electoral Commission in the post analysis. In terms of sustainability of what we have done, we identified seven areas. We cannot work in isolation. We need to work together. We need to reorganize, use the grassroots approaches, and also mainstream. Uh, if uh, we identify that mainstreaming is uh, effective. Um, currently, the status quo as we getting into 29 elections is uh, mainly to do with us. We are accredited as civic voter educators. We have partnered an organization. We have mobilized, as I've said, 29 at that time, and now there are 42. And uh, moving forward, uh, we are now developing a sustainable electoral process for 2024 based on the lessons that we are learning. And uh, I think with time, I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you, Action. Maybe. Thank you. Maybe during the Q&A, we can finish hearing more sure, no. things that you want uh, to pull forward. Um, next up is Tracy Von Go, Golf, um, from Sightsavers, uh, and giving us an overview of what Sightsavers is doing in this field. Thank you, Joseph. Yes, it's a very complicated name. <laughs> I'm Tracy Vaughan Goff. I'm the Senior Global Technical Lead for Social Inclusion in Sightsavers. Um, I'm responsible for leading the development and implementation of our programmatic strategy on social inclusion. Because in addition to all the work we do on neglected tropical diseases and eye health, we have a strand on inclusive education, economic empowerment and political participation. Um, my presentation is called Learning from Doing, and that was the intention of myself and my colleague Loren, who is here with me today, um, to come to the conference and listen to everybody else. We didn't propose our projects as um, potential award winners because we're still very new to this area. We have two projects currently on political uh, participation in Senegal and Cameroon. We're two years in, and we have another three years for both of those projects, which are funded by Irish Aid. Uh, the projects look at local development um, as well as um, inclusive elections. Um, so why didn't we propose our projects? Because we're too early in the stage. I mean, to achieve political uh, change in the way power is organized takes a long time, and we uh, feel that we're still um, in a process of understanding the context and identifying the most strategic entry points for challenging the status quo. So Sightsavers, just briefly, uh, we're an international NGO founded in 1950. Uh, we're based in the UK. We work to eliminate avoidable blindness, but also promote the rights of people with disabilities. We've got over 537 staff now in more than 30 countries, and the areas I already mentioned around eye health, neglected tropical diseases, social inclusion, and education. We're also one of the few NGOs in uh, the UK to have independent research organization status. And there's actually a, a reason I've, I've highlighted this, um, because for Sightsavers, it's very, very important for us to make sure that the programmatic decisions we take, the policy stances we take, are grounded in robust evidence. And um, I think we can probably all agree that actually evidence, robust evidence of what works um, in terms of disability inclusion is still um, somewhat lacking. So um, the particular area I'm talking about obviously is voice agency and participation. We feel this is important because if people with disabilities are not represented, are not visible, um, it's very unlikely that their issues are going to be addressed. So before starting this piece of work, we were very clear that we wanted to um, understand how best to do this. So on the screen, you can see on the right-hand side, we have an image of one of our publications, Disability Inclusive Elections in Africa, 
we commissioned a systematic review that looked at what had been happening in Africa over the last five years in terms of disability inclusion. And we found that while there was quite a lot of anecdotal evidence, a lot of information around the barriers to people's participation, there was very little that actually demonstrated effective uh, what works in terms of challenging the status quo. We looked at experiences, practices, um, but um, we felt that actually in terms of understanding the best approaches, we had to learn through doing ourselves and take what we had heard. So um, in terms of that, we've spent a lot of time trying to learn from others. We've spoken to experts from IFES, for example. We've looked at the literature that does exist. Um, we're also looking at building our own capacity and the capacity of our partners. At the start of our program, we decided that we needed to actually understand a lot more about the situation in, in Cameroon and Senegal, and we spent a lot of time gathering data uh, through desk reviews, but also uh, consultations with people with disabilities and decision makers. Um, we also conducted a household survey that entailed interviewing over nearly 4,000 people. Um, aged 18 and over, about disability and political participation. We did a study on the accessibility of voter stations. And we've, we've consolidated all of that um, to help us actually nuance our approaches moving forward. One of the other issues we're concerned with is how we actually monitor and evaluate the interventions we decide to do. On the screen, I've also got an image of a sort of a ladder it's actually uh, written in French, uh, because obviously the countries where we're working in are, are francophone. Um, but these ladders uh, have been developed to help us um, actually look at the quality and the impact of the participation of people with disabilities in the decision-making structures they're engaging. Um, having numbers of people present at a local council meeting, for example, does not actually mean uh, a change will happen. You have to actually look and understand whether the voices are being heard, whether the actions are being taken based on those voices and perspectives. So we're trying to look at creative ways of, of monitoring and evaluating the um, impact of the capacity building initiatives we're doing. So in terms of what we've learned so far, um, I think, as I said, early days, but one of the things that has come to us is, is the issue of balancing rights with protection. In many of the countries where we work, it's not actually a particularly safe space, the political sphere. And particularly for women, for example, women candidates are often a, a target of violence. So I think whatever we do, we have to actually ensure that people are protected. We've also found that there's a, um, an intersection, of course, of political disenfranchisement depending on economic status, um, gender, local culture, and um, the one-size-all approach clearly doesn't work, and we have to understand that in order to impact on change. Impartiality is, of course, critical. If we're engaging with political parties, we have to make sure we're engaging with political parties across the spectrum. And we, it's that hugely risky, of course, to um, um, come across as, as partisan in any way. So that's something that it's, it's very important to focus on. We've also decided to take a, an approach that looks both at micro levels, at the local levels, as well as macro levels. The space that is often most easy to engage is, is at local level. That's the first taste of political decision making. And, um, and that is where people can um, uh, test their skills, actually have an impact on, on policies that affect them in their local community. But at the same time, it's very important to take advantage of the national context and look at how uh, people with disabilities are included in uh, the legislative sphere and actually engaging in the election processes as well. Um, so moving forward, we are intending to have a much greater focus on women with disabilities and working with them to engage in mainstream um, women's rights organizations as well as within the DPOs. DPOs are often not necessarily representative in the countries where we work, so it's very important to look at other sectors, that, uh, other 
groups that they can engage with. Stigma and discrimination is a big issue, and I think if we work purely on capacity building of people with disabilities without actually looking at the discrimination that society perpetuates, um, you're, you're running a losing game. So we work with the media as well, and we look at different ways of trying to challenge and promote role models in terms of... Um, of, of inspiring others. And of course, sharing and learning and documenting what we're doing so that whatever we learn, what doesn't work as well as what does work is something that benefits other NGOs and others working in the sector. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy, for that as well. Um, we'll take a few questions now. Um, and I'll open this up to the, the entire panel. Um, if you could tell me, have you found that your, the government in your home country or the countries in which you work, in Tracy's case, um, are supportive of efforts of increasing political participation of people with disabilities, or is there some resistance to that notion? Anyone can jump in on that. Mm -hmm. <coughs> You're on. Uh, yeah. yeah, in fact, uh, there was a big intervention from the side of uh, people with disability. Initially, they were kept uh, under the shadow when uh, the political transformation was going on, when the people engagement was seen in the democratic process and the people with disability were in the front face. So in this instance, the parliament uh, realize that uh, people with disability have the political rights. And then uh, when uh, people with disability and the representing organization, they pushed for the accommodation of disability issue within the constitution of the country. And then through the constitution, the legal provisions enacted for the election, and then uh, the representation of people with disability has been ensured. So uh, attitude is one part, at the same time, the legal provision and the constitutional provision is a very important force to drive uh, the representation within the decision-making label and the parliament. That has been ensured in our context in Nepal. Um, maybe in the case of uh, Malawi, uh, we still have a, a long way to go. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, firstly, the legal environment uh, does not uh, promote uh, inclusion of persons with disabilities in, uh, in, in elections, which is uh, one hurdle that uh, we're now are working on and are fighting so that we go over that hurdle. As well as, uh, I think, uh, the ignorance among the uh, police makers, uh, it's one of uh, the biggest challenges that uh, we currently are faced with. Uh, uh, theo in theory, or when they are on the podium, they will preach that, uh, you know, talk about inclusion. But when it comes to practice, it's a big challenge. Yes, we have the Constitution, we have a Disability Act, which promotes this. But I think uh, we still ha have a lot to do. And also, I think on our part as uh, DPOs also, we need uh, to have uh, some strategic approaches, such as uh, litigation, so that we ensure that uh, actually there's change. Uh, just one last thing to add. I think working with electoral commissions has proved very successful for us and the institutions because often, actually, they just need support to help them implement the accessibility measures that they'd like to push forward. So helping with accessibility audits and um, training of electoral officials is something that they've um, welcomed. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that because my next question was going to be, what strategies or what partnerships have you found to be most useful for uh, gaining participation or gaining uh, a higher number of people with disabilities running for office or voting uh, as well? So have there been anything that have been um, particularly successful as a strategy that you've used? Well, I think as uh, Tracy has mentioned, uh, one key partner uh, that we have identified is the, the commission itself. Um, uh, post-2019 uh, elections and 2014, we have now developed uh, an elections uh, guide uh, based on uh, best practices from other countries as well as in consultation with uh, 
uh, IFS are looking at uh, some tools that have already uh, been uh, put in place. And uh, we sold uh, this idea to the commission, and now we have uh, our own guide that uh, currently guides us when we talk about uh, inclusive elections. Mm. Yeah. In fact, the strategy is that uh, when uh, uh, the political representation of uh, the vulnerable group of people has to be ensured, and then in, within this vulnerable group, uh, the political parties uh, has to make uh, their clear-cut manifesto. And within this, the manifesto of the political parties, if uh, the electoral process should accommodate people with disability, not only the representation in the electoral pro process, but also the representation in the parliament as a decision makers. So this strategy should come through the political parties, through their manifesto, as well as the strategy should be made by the ele election commission. And the election commission will only follow the legislation. That's why the the role of ele election commission can be to push the government for the enactment of the disability inclusive electoral process. If that happens, then it ensures the representation. So the main force is the election commission that can also guide the government for, the, for ensuring political participation as well as ensuring disability friendly and the accessible electoral system. Yeah, just one comment really, because I think in terms of um, candidacy for political parties and leadership, and we, we cannot forget that actually um, it's all about power and who in a country actually has power. And generally that's associated with economics, finances, um, ethnicity, and so on. And so there were so many barriers aside from one's um, disability that will impact on one's um, ability to be a candidate, that these are all things that we can't assume that political parties are necessarily benevolent. Mm. Um, so actually understanding that context um, is, is quite critical. I'd like to add one thing. So as if, uh, until and unless the people in this are seen as a voting vote bank, for the political parties. If uh, they are seen as a vote bank, then the political parties, the mindset, they will change. And the representation will be made much more uh, flexible uh, through their manifesto. Uh, and in this uh, context, uh, the self-representation and the self-advocacy is very, very important so that the mindset of the people as the political parties will be changed gradually. And that has to be ensured uh, through the implementation of Article 29 of CRPD that uh, uh, embrace uh, people with disability within the political representation as well as the people with disability are participating in the electoral process through the accessible voting system. We have a, a little bit of time left and I, you brought something up, Tracy, that I wanted to make sure I asked just because I think we should get it out there is what role does funding play in your ability to do what you want to do? Well, uh, I think uh, funding plays uh, a key or highest uh, percentage of, uh, I think, uh, impact on the work we do. Uh, because uh, we, when we look at the electoral uh, process cycle, uh, and uh, the inclusion of persons with disabilities. There's awareness to be made. Uh, we have to do some trainings and other things. All this maybe will also involve uh, uh, funding, so uh, especially for organizations of persons with disabilities, that is uh, one key factor that uh, needs to be played. And also, uh, we, we need to plan in advance, not only wait uh, towards an election, but this needs also to be uh, use a holistic approach maybe over a period of time. We know in 2024 there's an election. We start now preparing, but all this, what it causes funding. Mm. Uh, in my opinion also, the funding plays vital role uh, for making change uh, in the mindset as well as in the legal system. Uh, how the funding can play a role the funding is, itself is not a very, very important aspect, but uh, the funding that facilitate people with disability to come together, 
to push the political parties and uh, push for the enactment of the legislation disability friendly. So uh, the funding is very, very essential and the projects are very, very essential to launch the campaign for the political representation. So funding as well as the achievements are the two, two fish of the coin, I think. And just to add, it's actually not that easy to find funding for political participation initiatives. It's much easier to find programs that will support economic independence as well. So I think we also have to be creative in terms of thinking about actually how do these programs also impact on um, individuals' sort of confidence, social capital, and actually how those can then influence political change. Finally. <laughs> Finally, I'd like to add, uh, the funding, I mean, uh, it is uh, the very, very, very essential thing in the very beginning. But later, when the mindset is changed and the system that embraces people with disability to ensure the representation, then the legal provisions is in place, then the funding is not a big deal. Thank you. Well, unfortunately, I'm told that we're now out of time. Uh, and obviously, we could continue this conversation because I have plenty more questions, and I'm sure you all do as well. But I think all, each of our panelists will be around for you to discuss their work and to give them your ideas and thoughts as well. So if you'd please join me in thanking them for their presentations. And I think we're now, our session is now concluded. <laughs>